Happy Friday to everyone. Hee! It means you've got a whole weekend that you can study biochemistry. It doesn't get much better than that, right? So, um, all of you by now will have met in a recitation, and um, I hope that's all going well. One of uh, my um, jobs is obviously to make sure that you're learning things in the recitation and make sure that things are going fine there. If you're having difficulties with your TA or you're having any difficulties in recitation or things aren't working the way you think they should, I'm the person that you should be talking to. So let me know if there are problems or issues or anything I need to deal with and I will uh, try to help in any way that I can. Okay. Um, I'm going to say a few words to start uh, that will finish up our discussion of buffers and I hope that you will see as I'm going through it that this understanding of the relationship between pH, pKa, salt and acid actually tells us a lot. And what it tells us is, um, uh, it allows us is to predict the charge on a molecule. That's a very, very valuable thing because charge is a major factor influencing protein structure. As we change charge, we're going to change shape. There's no ifs, ands, ors, or buts about that. So understanding that relationship is very important. Now, I've assigned some problems. I've already had several of you in my office working through those problems, and I'm very happy to see that. That means that you're on top of it. In some cases, you're concerned, and I understand that concern. Uh, but if you're getting that help or you're coming in early, I think that's a, a very, very good sign. One of the things that the TAs are probably doing that may concern you some is some of them are working some of those problems using quadratic equations. I can assure you, you will not on an exam have to work a quadratic equation. Okay? So what's more important in, in working through some of those problems is understanding the principle. And the principle where they're working those quadratic equations is actually the principle is that of exceeding buffer capacity. That happens when you exceed a buffer's capacity. We're not going to work problems like that, but you still need to understand what a buffer's capacity really means. Okay? And I think if you work through the problems in the book, you'll, you'll see very well what, what I'm talking about there. Okay. Well, let me just finish up here, uh, make sure there's nothing else that I've overlooked in terms of um, covering things. Are there questions before I, before I say anything, uh, of the finishing thoughts here? Okay. Well, the reason that pH and pKa are important for charge is, of course, with pH and pKa, we can tell if a proton is on or a proton is off. So if a proton is on a carboxyl group, that molecule has a charge of zero. But if a proton is off of that carboxyl group, it has a charge of minus one. So let's imagine we've got a protein that's sitting here, and we've got two amino acids sitting next to each other. Okay? And they both have a charge of zero. They have no attraction towards each other. They have no repulsion for each other. But the pH changes slightly, and both of those gain a proton and become charged plus one. What's going to happen to them? They're going to repel. And that's going to be a force that's going to drive those amino acids away. And that force of driving those amino acids away is going to change the shape of the protein. So understanding when that happens, at what pH that happens, is a very, very important thing. It allows us to tell us if a protein may undergo some changes. That's very, very valuable for us. Okay? Now, I will remind you, and I'll probably need to remind you several times during this term, that a carboxyl group, when it's lost the proton, has a charge of minus one. A carboxyl group, when it has the proton, has a charge of zero. I just said that. An amine group, when it's lost its proton, has a charge of zero. And when it has a proton, it has a charge of plus one. Okay? They're backwards. You need to remember that. Okay? They're very backwards with, each, with respect to each other. Now, I talked about how a buffer um, has maximum buffering capacity when the concentration of salt equals the concentration of acid. That occurs when the pH equals the pKa. Okay? There's another term I want to introduce to you called the PI. And the PI uh, has a definition. The definition of the PI is the pH at which a molecule has a charge of exactly zero. I'm going to define that for you now. I'm going to show you a little bit later how we work with that. But a PI is the pH at which a molecule has a charge of exactly zero. Okay? Notice I said exactly. And the exactly is an important uh, consideration because I'm going to give you some shortcuts 
to allow you to predict charge, but those shortcuts will not give you PI. Okay? But the shortcuts you're going to find very valuable. All right? Well, what are those shortcuts? Well, you can take the henderson hasselbalch equation and you can run various pHs through it and various pKa's through it. And when you do that, what you will see is that, in fact, you can uh, really change the pH drastically and see that ratio of salt to acid change very drastically. But after a certain point, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Is it 99.99% off or is it 99.98% off? Really isn't, uh, for a proton, isn't really a big deal. Okay? So for this class, for our purposes, we're going to make the following assumptions. And these are assumptions I'm not going to write on your exam. So you'll want to learn these. And the henderson hasselbalch equation can actually show you the extent of these. And if you don't understand how that happens, I would recommend coming to see me. But I'm going to give you the assumptions. The assumptions are that the pH for a buffer, that is the pH that a buffer is in, the pH that a buffer is in is more than one pH unit above the pKa. It's reasonable to assume the proton is off. Yes? If the pH that a buffer is in is more than one unit above the pKa, we will assume the proton is off. Conversely, if the pH that a buffer is in is more than one unit below the pKa, we will assume the proton is on. Now, as I said, I think you should be able to look and use the henderson hasselbalch equation to convince yourself this is a re these are reasonable assumptions. If you don't know how to do that, talk to your TAs, talk to me, and I think you will become convinced that those are reasonable assumptions. Okay? There's some problems in the book that, that, and that I've assigned also that will help you to, to understand that better. All right. Now, those assumptions are going to become very, very valuable for us when we go to predict the charge of a protein. Because a protein has many amino acids, and many amino acids can have many different charges. And so being able to quickly go through and say, OK, that has a charge of plus 1, that has a charge of 0, that has a charge of minus 1, allows us to very quickly decide what the charge of a protein is. OK, that's what I want to say about buffers. And so I'm going to come back to buffers. What I'm going to do now is turn my attention to uh, protein structure. And with protein structure, we start talking about amino acid structure. So amino acid structure um, is right here. Okay. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. You learn this in basic biology. You learn this probably in organic chemistry. And the basic building blocks of proteins, there are 20 of them. 20 amino acids that are commonly found in proteins. Okay. You will be responsible for knowing the names of all of them. You will also be responsible for knowing the composition of their side chains in a simple fashion. And I'll show you what that means. Okay. I will not hold you responsible for memorizing the structures of those amino acids because that's simply an exercise in memorizing that I don't think is particularly useful for you. If you want to, of course, I won't stop you. But I kind of doubt that you will. All right. Now, before I talk about the amino acids, I want to say a few words about structure and reiterate um, the importance of structure and function. Okay? So I told you that the structure of a protein absolutely dictates what the protein does and how the protein functions. What you see on the screen here is a protein. It's a two duplicate copies of a protein, one shown in red, one shown in yellow. Okay? And it's a protein called the beta clamp. It's a protein that we'll talk a lot about next term when we talk about molecular biology. And you can see that the shape of this protein is very interesting. When the two pieces come together, they form a ring, and that ring goes around DNA. And that's kind of cool. And the beta clamp, <coughs> excuse me, what the beta clamp does is it forms a ring around DNA, and it holds a DNA polymerase onto it. The net effect of that is that that protein can go sliding down the DNA molecule, dragging the DNA polymerase with it, and the DNA polymerase does not fall off of the DNA. The structure of this protein, this ring, dictates this protein's function. The ring allows it to stay on the DNA. 
The other part of the protein grabs a hold of a polymerase and drags it along. So the polymerase can actually go along and make more DNA without falling off. That's a very important function. If I disrupt the function of this, if I disrupt the structure of this protein, I pull the two pieces apart, it's not going to stay on that DNA. Okay? So structure is essential for function. Another consideration about structure. This is a um, picture of um, an insect virus. Okay? An insect virus, uh, what, what, what you're going to see the more you study viruses, the more you're going to become convinced that viruses are the most amazing nano machines you've ever seen. A nano machine. What is a nano machine? A nano machine, you hear about nanotechnology. Everybody's excited about nanotechnology. We think about what is this is the latest, hottest, greatest thing. In nanotechnology, we're taking very small things, molecules, and making them do work, making them perform a function that we want them to perform. That's what nanotechnology is all about. Viruses figured it out long before mankind did because viruses have protein coats that can self assemble. Okay? It's the equivalent of a jigsaw puzzle putting itself together. That's literally what virus protein coats do. If you disturb one of those pieces, you can imagine certainly you're going to disrupt the ability of that virus to come together and make a protein coat. If you don't disturb that, that ability to self-assemble, to put itself together, to put the pieces of the puzzle together is built into the protein sequence of those virus proteins. That's pretty cool, pretty amazing. Another thing we're going to discover as we get talking about enzymes is that proteins, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting all choked up, that proteins are not fixed structures, okay? They're flexible. And their flexibility is frequently a consideration in their function, okay? Now, here is a protein that binds iron. You can see on the left side, it has not bound iron, and it's in a sort of a C shape. Upon binding iron, the flexibility of this protein causes its jaws, as it were, to clamp down. You might say, well, so what? Well, let's imagine that this is an enzyme, and the function of this enzyme is to catalyze a reaction where a molecule that the enzyme binds here is linked to a molecule that the enzyme binds here. If there's no iron, they'll just sit there as they are doing nothing. But when iron becomes present, the jaws clamp down, the two pieces are put together, and the enzyme and the reaction is catalyzed. So flexibility is a very, very important feature of proteins. Don't forget that. We'll talk about small changes in flexible proteins for a couple of weeks, and I think by the end of that, you'll become convinced of the importance of flexibility of proteins. Okay, well, that's the background for getting into talking about amino acids. Amino acids, of course, are the building blocks of proteins. As I said, there are 20 amino acids that are commonly found in proteins. There are a few others that we occasionally find, but they're usually there by modification, not by the process of synthesizing the protein. Okay? Usually there by modification. So for our purposes, we will have 20 amino acids there. Amino acids, of course, can exist in different stereoisomeric forms because they contain four different groups attached to a carbon. That carbon has a name called the alpha carbon. So what you see on the screen is a representation, schematically, of all of the amino acids. Okay? There's only one minor exception to that, and I'll explain that in a second. But all amino acids have an alpha carbon. What's the definition of an alpha carbon? An alpha carbon has attached to it an alpha carboxyl, an alpha amino, an R group, and a hydrogen. That's the basic composition of an amino acid. And the alpha carbon is at the center of all that. So it's the alpha carbon that forms the asymmetric center that you learned about in organic chemistry. Whenever you have a carbon that's a, that has four different things attached to it, in three-dimensional space, those four different things can be attached in two different ways. We call those D and L isomers. Biochemists are very lazy. We don't use R and S designations, and we keep it simple. Okay? You've got enough things to learn, right? So DNL, we, we work with DNL. Now, what's interesting, uh, the, as I said, there's only one exception to this, and the one exception is the amino acid known as glycine. I'll show you in a little bit. Glycine has, as its R group, it has a hydrogen, which means that it has two of the same things on there 
glycine is the only amino acid that does not exist in DNL forms. Okay? Only one that doesn't exist in DNL forms. Now, all the others exist in DNL forms. And if we take and we go in a test tube and we use chemical reactions to make those amino acids, what we will discover is that 50% of the amino acids that we're making, uh, let's say for alanine, 50% of them will be in the R configuration and 50% of them will be in the L configuration. Okay. If we look at amino acids that we take out of biological proteins, we discover something very different. What we discover is that all of the amino acids are present in the L configuration. Okay. Now that might seem puzzling because you say, well, chemically when you put them together, you get them as half and half. Okay. But amino acids in the body, in the cell, are made by enzymes that are themselves stereospecific. They only make one isomer because they have a three-dimensional configuration that specifically puts the things together in one specific way. That's very useful. Okay? Over evolutionary time, what has happened is that having L isomers meant that when you ate something else that had L isomers in it, you didn't waste anything on D isomers. Okay? So when everybody had the same isomers, we all used the same basic stuff. That's kind of cool. We're going to see a very minor exception to this where we see one place where we see D isomers. I'm going to talk about it later in the term. It's a very interesting thing. It occurs in bacteria, and it doesn't occur in proteins that do import, uh, that, that uh, perform functions in the cell. It's actually in a structural sense, and I'll show you those. Those are kind of cool. But for, with that minor exception, essentially everything exists in the L form. Now, one of the things that scientists who are interested in the uh, extraterrestrial nature of life are very interested in uh, examining is when they get a meteorite that falls from outer space, one of the questions they do is they find is they, they can go through and they can analyze and they find the meteorites contain amino acids. The question that is asked then is were these amino acids made by random chemical processes or were they the product of a life process? So they simply take those amino acids and they look at their configuration and determine were these things, do they have a, mostly an L, do they have mostly a D, or are they a mix of the two? Those are very cool things. Someday they'll find a meteorite that probably has all of one or the other, and they're going to jump up and down, and you'll hear a lot about it. So far, that hasn't happened. Okay. <clears throat> blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, more blah, blah, blah. Forget the graph. I think the graph is just kind of dumb. But the top shows you what happens with an amino acid with respect to ionizing. I talked last time about how an amino acid has two different groups that can ionize. It has an amine group and it has a carboxyl group. If we look at this schematic representation of this amino acid on the top, what we see is that on the left side, this amino acid is in the form that I describe as all protons on. That is, everything that can gain a proton has gained a proton. Okay? The amine group has a proton, and of course when an amine group has a proton on it, it has a plus charge. The carboxyl group has a proton on it, and when it has a proton on it, it has a zero charge. So if we were to look at this as it stands on the screen, we would say at this particular pH where this guy exists, the charge in this molecule is plus one. If we start raising the pH, what we discover is that one of the protons comes off first, and the one that comes off first will be the one that has the lowest pKa. I hope you remember that. That lowest pKa will belong to the carboxyl group, because the carboxyl group is a stronger acid than an amine group is. And that carboxyl group, therefore, generates a charge of minus 1. At this point, we have a molecule that has a net charge of 0. This molecule has a special name. Okay? So molecules that have an overall charge of 0 are called zwitterions. Z-W-I-T-T-E-R-I-O-N-S. Zwitterions. Okay? So we have a zwitterion here in the middle. As we keep increasing the pH, we discover that we start getting to the point where we near the pKa for the amine group, and the amine group loses its proton, and we see the molecule on the right. So now over here, this guy has an overall charge of 0, minus 1, or an overall charge of minus 1. Okay? Now, notice that we have three different forms of the molecule. We have two pKa's. 
Some of you have already come to me concerned about the fact that there's a problem that has four different forms of phosphate, but only three PKAs. How can that be? The way that can be is that the PKAs aren't associated with the molecule. They're associated with the paired reaction. Here's a PKA for this pair. Here's a PKA for this pair. That's why we have three molecules, two different PKAs. We're going to see that some amino acids have R groups that contain ionizable uh, forms, and we'll talk about those as well. So when we look at amino acids, we see several possibilities for different charges that they can have and different pKa values that they can have. Questions about that? Yes? Over here, that's the charge of minus one. Okay, clear as mud. Yes? I'm sorry? Is that special? This guy? Yeah. It's, no. It's, it's called a molecule with a charge of minus one. Molecule with a charge of minus one. So that'd be a M-O molecule, M-W-A-C-O-M-O, -M -O. Right. mo <laughs> Okay? That's what I call it. That's what I call it. Okay. Now, I said you wouldn't have to memorize the structures of amino acids. One thing you should definitely know is the category they fit into. So if I say, oh, let's say uh, alanine, you should be able to figure out where alanine fits in. It's a simple one, OK? Your book likes to use the term acidic and basic in describing the amino acids. And since I said I don't like using the term basic, I'm going to give them different names. And the different names I have given them are carboxyl for the acidic ones, and amino for what your book calls the basic ones. That's what we're going to call them in this class. And these are the categories that you'll be responsible for. So I'm going to show you all these in just a second. Okay. Now I should also point out that when you look in different books, as you can see, names change sometimes. And in some cases, different books put some groups in one or the other a little bit differently. So that what I'm showing you on the screen here is what we're going to use in this class in terms of categorization. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Let's look at the simple amino acids, okay? The simple amino acids here, uh, glycine and alanine, all right? By the way, you don't have to know the abbreviations, so I will, I will never give you something and say, what's the abbreviation for glycine and that sort of thing, okay? Um, I will tend to write them out, and if, for, for example, I have written only GLY, raise your hand on the exam and say, hey, you said we weren't have to know these, and I'll say, oops, glycine, okay? So you don't have to know the abbreviations, all you, but you do need to know the names. Glycine looks like this. As I said, the R group in glycine is a hydrogen. So glycine has two hydrogens, which means it is the only amino acid that does not have stereoisomers. It has an alpha amine, it has an alpha carbon, and it has an alpha carboxyl. Alanine is very much like glycine, except for instead of having a hydrogen, it has a methyl group as its R group. Now, one of the things you're going to see as I go through talking about the different categories of amino acids is that some of them will have very bulky R groups, some of them will have charged R groups, some of them will have uncharged R groups. And these are all factors in determining the shape of a protein that they uh, are contained in. Okay, the aliphatics. The aliphatics include valine, leucine, isoleucine, methionine. And they have the common feature that they have relatively short side chains that are totally uncharged. That is, they have aliphatic groups. Okay? Now, these aliphatic groups are not charged. They are nonpolar, meaning they don't like to interact with water. So aliphatic amino acids are uncharged, nonpolar, don't like to interact with water. You'll notice that one of these, methionine, actually contains a sulfur. That's what that yellow ball is right there. Notice that the sulfur is each bound to two carbons. That sulfur has no charge. It cannot oxidize. It cannot reduce. And we'll see that's a consideration for the other amino acid that does contain sulfur. This amino acid <coughs> is pretty much boring. It stays as it is. It doesn't get changed as a result of chemical reactions very easily. Okay, 
So those are the aliphatic amino acids. There's one amino acid described as a cyclic, okay? And cyclic, there are other ones that we'll see have rings, but the rings are in the R group. In this case, the cyclic refers to the fact that the alpha amine is actually linked to the side chain. So here's the R group going up here, and you see it comes back and it links with the alpha amine group. This amino acid is proline. And proline is an interesting amino acid. Because it has this ring as part of its basic structure, what we're going to discover is that proline is not nearly as flexible as the other amino acids are. And as a consequence, what we see when we look at the structure of proteins is that wherever we have a proline, we frequently see a bend in the chain. And that bend occurs because of this lack of flexibility of proline. Very commonly that happens. Okay? Okay. Moving on. We have three amino acids that have aromatic rings. And all three of these amino acids have their aromatic rings in the R group. So to orient you here, there's the alpha amine, there's the alpha carbon, there's the alpha carboxyl, and this thing up here is the R group. So you remember I told you that some of these guys have pretty good sized R groups. Biggest guy up here, tryptophan. Look at tryptophan. Great big two ring R group out there. You can imagine that if we start packing amino acids together in a protein, which is what happens when a protein folds, that things that have a big R group are going to be, need bigger spaces in which to exist. They're going to squeeze other things out because of their size. That'll be a consideration in determining the overall shape of the protein. Both phenylalanine and tryptophan are very nonpolar. Tyrosine is identical to phenylalanine, except for it contains an, a, 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 a hydroxyl group on its side chain. That hydroxyl group gives it a little bit of polarity. We're going to see later in the term when we talk about signaling that tyrosine is a very interesting and important amino acid that's in proteins specifically when it gets a phosphate put onto it. And that hydroxyl group plate provides a place to put a phosphate. Okay, so those are the um, aromatics. There are two that we categorize as aliphatic hydroxyl. That's kind of a, almost an oxymoron. But an aliphatic hydroxyl means that it has an aliphatic group, in this case uh, a CH2, with a hydroxyl link to it. <clears throat> now, in contrast to the aliphatics, these guys, because they have the hydroxyl groups, are in fact fairly water soluble. They're very hydrophilic, that is, they like water. The simplest of these is serine, the other being threonine. Now, there are only three amino acids that contain hydroxyl groups. One of them you saw on the last slide, that was tyrosine. We put it with the aromatics. These two guys here contain hydroxyl groups. <clears throat> and the hydroxyl groups, as I mentioned with respect to tyrosine, are targets for what's called phosphorylation. That is, targets for putting a phosphate on. We're going to discover that one of the ways that cells control the function of proteins is by putting phosphates on and taking them off. And those always happen at hydroxyl groups. They always happen at hydroxyl groups. There's only three amino acids that can get a phosphate. Serine, threonine, and tyrosine. Clear as mud? That is important for signaling. We'll talk about signaling about halfway through the term, and you'll, you'll, just, you'll see that at that point. Okay? Okay. Uh, tyrosine? Okay. Um, two here are called carboxamides. <clears throat> I was very pleased in this edition of your book, your book finally came around with the rest of the world and called these carboxamides. In the previous edition of the book, they called them um, acidic amino acids, and that's not correct. Okay? Definitely not correct. So carboxamides have a carboxyl group, but instead of having an OH, they have an NH2. They're called asparagine, and there's the NH2 group that you can see right there. If this were a, car a real carboxyl group, that would be an OH there, but instead it's an NH2. 
And that's why they're called carboxamides, because the NH2 uh, is making an amide bond with that carbon. And glutamine. Okay? Now, these two guys, uh, we will see are um, very important. Um, and actually, we won't say much about it, but I will tell you briefly. When we look at nitrogen metabolism, okay, we look at how uh, nitrogen moves through cells. <coughs> One of the ways in which this happens is through these nitrogen groups that we see on here. So these are very important in the metabolism of nitrogen. There's only 20. So it seems like there's an awful lot here as I'm going through them, doesn't it? Now, here is one of the most interesting amino acids, I think. And we're going to say a lot about this one as we go further along. And that's the amino acid known as cysteine. <clears throat> cysteine, as I mentioned earlier, has a sulfur. But notice that that sulfur is only attached to one carbon. The other side of it is attached to a hydrogen. That makes what we call a sulfhydryl. And the sulfhydryl turns out to be fairly reactive, number one and has the ability to ionize number two. When it ionizes, it loses a proton and becomes charged minus one. Now, the ionization is important. We won't say an awful lot about that this term. But the reactivity of this group is very important. Well, how do I mean when I say reactive? What happens to it? If I take two cysteines, and I put them into close proximity to each other, what will happen is they will react with each other, they will kick out the hydrogens, and they will be joined by the two sulfurs. They form at that point what's called a disulfide bond. Okay? So this is a very reactive amino acid. It's an amino acid that, um, uh, whose reactivity is very important in stabilizing, excuse me, in stabilizing the structure of many proteins. I like to think of this as a sort of a, a beam that is holding up a building, okay? Because this bond that is formed, this um, uh, disulfide bond, is a covalent bond. And covalent bonds are extraordinarily strong. I talked earlier about hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds compared to covalent bonds are very, very weak. So when you want to have something have structural integrity, you want to have a tight bond, you want to have a strong bond, and the disulfide bond helps to provide that. Okay. Okay, so that's what cysteine does. There are three amino acids that we categorize, that I categorize as amino amino acids, right? Amino amino acids. That's yes, that's right. Amino amino acids. Amino amino acids are amino acids that have an R group <coughs> that has an amine. So look at lysine here. Lysine okay, has um, an alpha amino, an alpha carbon, an alpha carboxyl. And here's its R group. And look out here at the end. There's an amine group. Notice this guy what is shown with the, the proton on. So it's got a plus one charge, a plus one charge, and a minus one charge, or an overall charge here of plus one. Its actual charge will depend upon the pH of the solution in which it finds itself. So they've drawn it with a plus one charge. Arginine has a similar structure. And arginine actually has what look like two amino groups out there. There's only one of them that can gain a proton. And we will just treat it as if it's a, a, a single amino group for the purposes of our calculation. Okay? So I'll draw this as an R group with an amine. I'll draw this one as an R group with an amine. Okay? It can also be charged plus one, just like this can. But it can only be tar charged a total of plus one in the R group. The third one of these, of course, is histidine. Histidine is shown here. And in histidine, the nitrogen that's right there can gain or lose a proton. Okay? In this case, they've shown it without the proton. So you have an overall charge of plus 1, minus 1, or a charge of 0. And again, we will treat this simply as if it's a simple amine. We'll write it as an R group with an amine. And you can think of it as either being plus 1 or a charge of 0. Now. Each of these R groups, because they have protons that can come on and go off, have their own pKa. They have their own pKa. That means, therefore, that something like lysine has three pKa values. If I were to ask you to describe the buffer plot for that, we're plotting pH versus OH added, what would it look like? 
three flattened regions, right? Up, flat, up, flat, up, flat, up, right? The flattened regions corresponding to each PK, uh, each PKA value that we have. Make sense? You guys look a little zombie here today. Okay. Let's see. Um, there's the ionization of histidine. Okay, you can see uh, the proton on, you can see the proton off. And again, you're not responsible for structure. All you need to know is it's basically an amine that's gaining or losing a proton. That's all we're concerned about there. Okay. And uh, last, I want to talk about the carboxyl amino acids. <coughs> there are two of these. Your book describes them as the acidic amino acids. The carboxyl amino acids have R groups that have a carboxyl group out there. And so a carboxyl can gain or lose a proton. When it loses the proton, it has a charge of minus one. When it gains a proton, it has a charge of zero. <coughs> okay? And again, that carboxyl group is going to have its own pKa value. So these guys also have a buffer plot that goes up, flat, up, flat, up, flat, up. What's going on? I'm losing my signal. Okay? Make sense? Have we got that visualized? Clear as mud? You have a question? Yeah, uh -huh. So what I mean is that, for example, if I said I had a carboxyl group and it, and it had a, a pKa, that would mean that there's two things. You can have an off or on, and that'll have a pKa, and this one will have a pKa of about 2.2. This guy can be off or on, that is NH3 plus or NH20, and that'll have a pKa of about 9. This guy can have a, uh, a proton on or off, and the pKa for that is going to be around 4 or 4.5. Okay? So each one of those groups will have their own pKa. So there's not one pKa for, the, for this molecule, there are three. Okay? Make sense? I can't see it. Hey, back in the back, yeah. Just a second. That R group has a PKA. I'll show you a table in just a second. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. No, good question. Do they all always have three hydrogens? And as you'll see, when I, when I showed you histidine, for example, okay, if you look at histidine, uh, well, let me go back to the ionization of histidine, you'll see that the one that ionizes has either zero or one. Okay. But we'll think about it in simple terms. If you want to think about it as having three versus two, that's fine as far for our purposes. We're not doing structure. So here's the uh, history right here. So you can see by this guy gaining a proton, it has a charge of plus one. And that's partly because it has other bonds tied up in this ring. That's why it has that, that situation. If it were an amine by itself, then yes, it would have either three or two. Okay? You can't tell if it has three or two unless you know the pH and the pKa, right? That's, that's always what's going to determine it, okay? Did you have a question? Is there, is there one pKa per charge? There's one pKa per ionization. So that's why I'm describing them as on or off. That on or off is going to have one pKa associated with it. Make sense? Yeah. Yep. If you have a carboxyl and you have a carboxyl in the argument, why don't they have the same pKa? Very good question. Let me show you why. Okay? Because the environments that they're in are different. Chemically, okay, environment determines everything about a molecule. This guy down here is much closer to this amine group than this guy is up here. All right? That makes it easier for this guy to lose its proton than it is for this guy to lose its proton. So this guy, therefore, has a lower pKa than this one does. Make sense? <coughs> Excuse me. Everybody with me? We're, we're moving along. Okay. Good. Um, here's a pKa table. Okay. So students always, I, I, I tell students, you don't have to memorize pKa's. Whatever you need with pKa's, I will give you on an exam. And they always expect it's going to be in the form of this table. It may or may not be in the form of this table. I'll give you the necessary information. But this table shows you how these different groups um, uh, uh, ionize and what their pKa value is. So aspartic acid, for example. There's the R group. Okay? We see the R group has this, and when it loses the proton, it has this. If we look at a terminal alpha carboxyl, 
Remember, the alpha carboxyl is a component of every amino acid. The alpha carboxyl does this, the pKa. And by the way, pKa values vary a lot. 3.1 really isn't very accurate. It's more like about 2.2. Okay. Um, histidine, there's its R group. Um, here's the terminal amine group. That is the alpha amine, and that is definitely not right. That's more like about 9 than it is about 8. There's cysteine. You see cysteine loses a proton, becomes a negative charge, and looks like that. Tyrosine looks like that. Now, you should be able, from your knowledge, the general knowledge that you have about these side chains, to know what the charges are on there, what the possible charges are. That's why I'm probably not going to give you a table that shows you those actual charges, because that was something I expected that you would know. All right? The pKa values that you need, I'll give you. I'm just not going to show you what the charges and so forth are. Does that, that make sense? OK. Uh, some of these have real high pKa values. Here's arginine. PKA value 12.5. Okay, pretty high. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's another form of the PKA table. Okay, and you can see they're not, they're not even consistent in their own thing. On the last one, they showed you that the alpha amine, I'm sorry, the alpha carboxyl was 3.1. Do you see a single one that has an alpha carboxyl above 2.3? The uh. Okay. I don't know. They had different people working on different things, and somebody may use random numbers. I think. Okay, not a good idea. But you can see here, alpha carboxyl, alpha amine, side chain. Not all amino acids have ionizable side chains. <coughs> Excuse me. The um, aliphatics, for example, don't have ionizable side chains. Okay. A lot of these don't have ionizable side chains. So the only the ones that have ionizable side chains have pKa values associated with the R group. Okay. Uh, let's see. How are we doing here? Abbreviations. That's there if you want them. You don't need to know them. There's both three-letter and one-letter abbreviations. As I said, you will not be responsible for those, so I'm not going to hold you to that. Reactivity, we'll talk more about that later, so I'm not going to talk about that there. I want to say just a brief word about ionization and then get you thinking about this, and I'll probably say a little bit more about this uh, in the lecture on Monday. Here's the schematic I showed you earlier. You now, I hope, recognize this is for a simple amino acid, that is an amino acid that does not have an ionizable R group, because if it had an ionizable R group, we'd have yet another possible charge that would be in there. Okay. If we look at the um, titration of an amino acid, here's glycine. If we look at glycine, here's the titration that we see. pH versus OH added, we see it going up, we see it leveling off for the first pKa value, we see it going up, and we see it leveling off for the second pKa value, and then we see it going up again. <coughs> It goes up because we've exceeded buffering capacity in each time. Now, what I'm not going to tell you here, but I want you to think about next time, is that this point right here is called the PI. It's the place where the molecule has a net charge of zero. You say, oh, that's easy. It's halfway in between this one and this one, which is correct. But this is only true for a simple amino acid. If we look at an amino acid that has R groups, we have to look at it in a different way. And what I'd like you guys to do before Monday would be to look at those and think about how that happens. There's one example here, up here. Scroll down, okay. There's one example that's a simple one there, and there are more complicated ones there. So I'd like you to think about that and think about how you could calculate PI. Now, in the meantime, I decided from last time, I'm going to give you guys a pop quiz, okay? So, what we need to do, you're very quiet, see how much you've learned. Who wants a pop quiz? One pop quiz, okay. You can kill her later. All right, I'll make a deal with you. We won't have a pop quiz, but you have to go along with me on something, okay? You got it? Because if you don't, we're going to have a pop quiz. You have got to sing your lungs out here, OK? If you don't, we're going to have a pop quiz. Are you ready? Very simple song. So it's a Christmas song. There's only 81 shopping days till Christmas. It's called Biochemistry, Biochemistry to the tune of Old Christmas Tree. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I wish that I were wiser. I feel I'm in way or my head. I need a new advisor. 
My courses really shouldn't be such metabolic misery. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I wish that I were wiser. Biochemistry, biochemistry, reactions make me shiver. They're in my heart and in my lungs, they're even in my liver. I promise I would not complain if I could store them in my brain. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I wish that I were wiser. I can't hear you. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I'm truly in a panic. The mechanisms murder me. I should have learned organic. For all I have to memorize, I ought to win the Nobel Prize. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I wish that I were wiser. Okay, I think that's good enough. Certainly. <laughs> How you doing? Good to, you. Good to see you, Jessica. Good to see you. Um, question. Uh, Zitarania, I can't say it correctly. Zitarania. Zitarania. Um, is there any relationship between that and the PI? Like, yes. Oh, there yes. Is. Okay. At the PI, you'll only have Zitarians. Okay. Yep. Hi. How you doing, guy? Good to see good, you. Good. Good. Yeah, you uh, made it I back was, safely. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I was. Uh, I just met Janine. Oh yes. Yeah. So we were talking about you and she said. Oh, okay. She made me to tell you. That. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's good. You had, a, you had a busy summer, I'm guessing. Uh, well, yeah. Did you get it much was, done? Yeah, yeah. I got my uh, survey done. I got some sample oh, break. Oh, right hey, in. how you doing? Uh, I was just talking about, with Trimpy about that. Yeah. So I'm going to come hey, soon you. to see you about all those stuff. Good. Yeah, come yeah. see me. I'm yeah. happy to. Yeah. 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 We and should I definitely talk. all the survey and all the stories Sure. That I have. Good for you. Yeah, <laughs> lots of stuff. So it was fun. A wild summer, it sounds like. It was. I'm it sure was. it was. It was. Take care. Enjoyed it to the full extent. So yeah, but do, do come by my office. Yeah, I will. Okay. I will Take care.